So good morning once again. Um, I should like to speak about 3D laser nanoprinting, none of the subjects that Antonio actually mentioned. So just as a bit of background, you may have noticed that additive manufacturing, three-dimensional additive manufacturing, or loosely 3D printing is a big trend, a big hype actually also. Some people say that in 10 years time we will perhaps manufacture 10% of all goods by 3D additive manufacturing. And industry likes that a lot because uh, you can customize goods, you can individualize goods, you don't have to store them by large numbers, and perhaps most importantly you can suddenly make things that seem very difficult if not uh, impossible to make just a couple of years ago. And this is about the mini version of that, the micro scale and sub micro and nanometer scale version of 3D printing. And it's, um, I'm going to give you an overview, an introduction, and what the state of the art is and what the challenges are. So uh, this is the basic principle. So we usually take very tightly focused femtosecond laser pulses. And then by means of two photon absorption or some other super linear process, we concentrate the energy in a tiny volume element that we call the voxel, in analogy to the pixel, the picture element, the volume element. And then in this volume element, typically a chemical reaction takes place. Very often, you make the transition from a liquid monomer to a solid polymer. And then we scan the focus, as you have seen, by computer control. And at the end of the day, you take a developer, can be a simple chemical like acetone, for example, and you wash out the remaining liquid monomer, and you are done. You have a structure on a substrate, or you can also have it free-floating if you like to. If you have a hard time finding it then. Um, usually we do it on, on a substrate. So let me give you a flavor um, by, by some numbers. So very often we are using wavelengths in the range of 800 nanometers. And that is because many molecules that we use for absorbing the light have their one photon absorption peak around very roughly 400 nanometers. So we go to twice of that wavelength. We're going close to the diffraction limit, actually to the diffraction limit. So in many of the examples I show you, we're using oil immersion microscope lenses with a numerical aperture of 1.4. And then uh, typically we use actually quite low powers. We talk about average powers in the range of 10 milliwatts or so. Not so much more than this laser pointer provides here. It can also be 1 milliwatt. In extreme case it can be 50. These are rough numbers. But then due to the fact that we're using femtosecond pulses in the range of 100 or 200 femtoseconds duration, we concentrate this power, this energy in time, and we also concentrate it in space such, such that at the end of the day, the intensity, the optical intensity in the focus is in the range of 10 to the 12 watts per centimeter square. Or if you like that, that's 10 to the 13 times the sun intensity on a sunny day. Today it's maybe even 10 to the 14 or so. Um, so it's quite intense. When I got in this field, I thought, oh, it's going to be very, very difficult to get two-photon absorption. That's not the case. Anything you take shows two-photon absorption at these intensities. The problem is rather that you don't get other crazy processes. So to give you a feeling, this, this writing I was telling you about happens at a certain threshold. I will say more about this in just a minute. And then typically, if you go up in power by a factor of two or three, then crazy processes, multi-photon absorption kicks in, and what we very often see is then you get micro-explosions in these photographs. So there's a fairly small window between nice writing and destruction of the structure, but that's not a problem because we can control the laser power today very well. So let's have a closer look at the focus and what's going on in there, and what the line width and what the resolution is that we can achieve. So what I'm showing you here are some ISO intensity surfaces. Actually, I'm showing you the intensity squared and ISO surfaces of that in three-dimensional space. So this would be the optical axis, the direction in which we are focusing. And if you find that too complicated to look at, you can also look at this cut, which I show on the right-hand side. It's a focus, no surprise so far. Keep in mind we're using 800 nanometers wavelength, and these numbers are for 800 nanometers. So the full width and half maximum of this two-photon profile here is 230 nanometers, if you go through the numbers. So it's already quite a bit smaller than the wavelength we're talking about. So now, how does this optical profile translate into a line that we are writing? Um, here, a very simple model is useful that is called the threshold model. This model says basically that if locally inside of the resist, 
the dose, the deposited number of photons, the exposure dose exceeds a certain value such that the molecules are sufficiently cross-linked, then this material is not washed out. It will remain after the developer. Whereas if the local dose is below that threshold, then the molecules are not sufficiently cross-linked and this part of the structure will be washed out. Such that at the end of the day, if I take this away, for this particular choice of the threshold, and this would be the intensity squared as a function of coordinate, you would get this kind of egg in three-dimensional space. That's the physical structure that we have exposed. And in this case, it would have this width of 230 nanometers. And you can see something that is not very nice, that is that this profile is elongated in the axial direction. And that basically comes from the fact that we are only focusing with one lens from one half space. We are only using half of the possible spatial frequencies. And this factor of two also shows up in an elongation that is fundamentally at least a factor of two in this direction. Because we don't have perfect focusing, it's actually a bit more than a factor of two. So if you do a good job, you get a factor of 2.5. If you don't align your optics nicely, you easily get a factor of 3, 4, 5 or worse than that. So that's what we typically get. So is this the line width we get? No, not necessarily. We can just attenuate the laser, like I show here. And you see if a smaller and smaller fraction is above this threshold, then this voxel, this volume element, becomes smaller and smaller. And in fact, um, we can make it smaller than 100 nanometers in experiment. That's about the limit experimentally, because this threshold is not perfectly sharp, etc., etc. But we routinely get to a line width of lambda over 10 with this kind of a technology. Do we beat the diffraction limit? No, this has nothing to do with beating the diffraction limit. This is a diffraction-limited focus. And by the fact that we have this threshold, which is basically a very strong nonlinearity, there is no limit for the line width. So on paper, and I emphasize on paper, I cannot do this experimentally, we can go just a teeny tiny bit above this threshold and make a one nanometer line conceptually. I emphasize this because there's a lot of crap in the literature. There is no diffraction limit for the line width. There is simply none. So you cannot beat anything there. But we do get lambda over 10 routinely because of this threshold, basically. Um, we have been doing this for quite some time. My group is doing this for nearly 20 years, and a bit more than 10 years ago, we founded a company, so you should know I'm biased. Um, we founded a company, it's called Nanoscribe, which sells this instrumentation, just that you get a flavor. So we're not talking about halls full of equipment, we're talking about tabletop equipment, and in fact, if you push it, you could even make this a lot smaller. So this is really going towards a printer, a 3D printer, in the sense you know a printer is something you put uh, on your office desk and do things. And hence, I've selected a couple of examples that are recent from users, from, from groups other than my own group. And in some examples, I'm also involved a little bit to make the point that this is not something you have to learn for two years and then maybe after some painful work you get one or two structures at the end of the day. This technology has come to a point that everybody can learn this in, in a week, actually less than a week. You can take a crash course, learn how to do it, and then everybody can make the structures I'm showing you next. Of course, not including any design. If you know what you want to make, you can make it. I'm not responsible for the design part here. This can take you a long, long time to design fancy systems. So here are some examples. This is a, a simple one from Harald Giesen's group um, about two years ago. He published this paper here, and I think it was his response to meta lenses, if you have heard this. There's a lot of hype about making micro-scale, nano-scale lenses with micron-scale uh, focal lengths, just mini lenses. And uh, you might as well do them by conventional optics, and that's the point of this paper. Just miniaturize the ideas that are in your camera objective lens by making a single lens, a singlet, or make a double lens, or make a triple lens. These are just cut open that you can see something. Of course, the functioning device would not have this opening. And here you even have more degrees of freedom to correct aberrations than you have with meta surfaces, meta lenses, just in case you have heard about this. <coughs> if you compare the image quality here, it's getting obviously better towards the triplet. 
And this is something you can print in, I would guess, 10 minutes, 20 minutes for one of these lenses. That's the state of the art. By the way, that's something I forgot. So when we scan this focus, today the state of the art is that you can go up to 10 centimeters per second speed. That's what we are talking about. So with submicron resolution, as I showed you, you get 10 centimeters per second. That's the maximum. If your resist is perfect, everything is perfect. If not, you have to go a little bit slower. So you can print this stuff, and Harald has shown this on the ends of fiber facets. You can directly print it onto camera chips, for example, do all kinds of fancy things. And it's very, very simple to do this. There's another example from a colleague from KIT, from Christian Koos. And he calls these things photonic wire bonds, because they are kind of the counterpart of electrical wire bonds. So very often, if you want to build an optical system by optical chips, the problem is that you have different pieces, different dices, and you have to connect them to one another optically. Electrically, that's a piece of cake. You go to a wire bonder and make a couple of small connections, and you are done. Optically, this was not so simple until this technology came about. So here, for example, if you have an indium phosphide laser and you want to connect it to some waveguides on a silicon chip, um, how do you do it, actually? The modes do not match optically. Sometimes even the direction uh, doesn't match, like in this case. This guy wants to go up here, and this has obviously this guided direction. <coughs> but if you write such a polymer structure, like shown here, that's the polymer part, you can simply connect them. And in the beginning, I thought, oh, this is going to be awful because you will get some terrible mode mismatch between the semiconductor waveguide and this polymer waveguide. No, you don't, because you can adiabatically taper this, like shown here. You adiabatically match the modes. And Christian has shown that you get less than 0.1 decibel losses. You get very large bandwidth in telecommunication systems. This is a no-nonsense technology. And actually, he founded another company the purpose of which is to automate this. That you can just take the chip, um, take a camera system to read it in, and then all the writing is done in an automated fashion. This is now going to industry, at least that's um, his um, agenda. He also thinks further, there's another paper from Christian Kohl's group, again all done with existing commercial nanoscribe technology, where the dream is to go to three-dimensional optical chips. I mean, you know, today most optical chips are planar, Electronic chips were planar many years ago also, but then industry went to many, many layers. But then the issue is you have to connect these different layers. There was a breakthrough in electronics, VIAS they called it, to make connections in the third dimension. Now in optics there was no such technology, but now we, we can simply print these things. We can print devices that match the mode between different devices, that change the direction, that just bring the light up. There's a long discussion of all the possibilities that you have here, and you can print this off the shelf. By the way, I didn't mention this, and um, there is no post-processing. If you take a proper resist and do it right, you can get down to surface roughnesses of just a very few nanometers would mean squared. So you directly print optical quality surfaces with this kind of a technology. <coughs> a bit in the same direction goes this example from Wolfram Penis. We started this um, some years ago uh, together. Now he's in Münster and has prepared these Alphorn couplers. He calls them Alphorn couplers because they look like an Alphorn. Um, we have experts on this uh, in the audience here. And again, the issue is um, if you have prepared a very nice two dimensional optical chip for classical optics or for quantum optics, something like you see here. At the end of the day, as an experimentalist, you somehow have to connect that chip to the outside world. How do you do it? How do you connect it to laser sources that you have on your table or whatever? And this is not so easy. People have been using grating couplers, uh, so gratings on the surface, and then the light is refracted into the plane. They have some decent efficiency, but they are usually quite narrow in bandwidth because they depend on the grading period and you have to match that to the wavelength. Um, this thing is very, very broadband and it's kind of <coughs> nice because it combines two ideas that I showed you. Here you have a lens part on top of it and then this adiabatically goes over in a waveguide that is again tapered to go into some semiconductor, I think this is a silicon nitride waveguide here. Again, you can do this with very high efficiency and you can do it over a very broad bandwidth. And it's not about making one of these devices 
it's about making dozens or hundreds. I hope you can see this. All these little things here are Alphorn couplers. So it takes you, I would guess, a few minutes to make one of them. And this, by the way, is obviously just that the thing doesn't fall down. This has no optical function. This is just a mechanical holder, if you want to, of these things. So this has become quite standard. This is the last example I show you here. It's from Wolf Wolfhagel's group at KIT, and we have helped them a little bit. This is a different story. They are experts in scanning tunneling microscopy. And um, if you inject the current locally, you get with very low efficiency also light emission. And that's very interesting because you can control this current on an atomic scale and then look at the light emitted with this um, spatial resolution that you got. Now, people have done this before, and what you usually do is you have this STM tip, and then you have to have some collection optics, usually some bulky uh, microscope lens, that you have to bring down under low temperature conditions and under ultra-high vacuum conditions in such a cryostat, and you somehow have to find a way to also adjust this and then bring the light all the way up through this cryostat to your measurement instrumentation. And here the idea of Wolf Wolfhagen's group was to all integrate this and 3D print the entire thing. So what you see here is a parabolic mirror, it's at least roughly parabolic, it's shown upside down, and this mirror in the inside just collects the light. And what you see here is this is just a holder, this is the STM tip, also made by the same technology, and then the light is emitted in this direction, and this thing sits directly on an optical fiber, and this fiber leads the light all the way from down here, eventually to your spectrometer somewhere on the table. It's very cool and convenient and easy. In the beginning, I was afraid, oh, man, um, this is going to be destroyed very quickly. But these people have learned how to work with tips very, very carefully. So actually, we have made a couple of tips in the beginning, and we never looked at the second and third and fourth generation because they measured with the first tip for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. This is actually cool because it's just making sim things simpler and the collection efficiency is also fairly high for these conditions. I mean, sometimes in these experiments, people are talking about days of integration to get one spectrum. So here it's now getting down to a scale of a couple of minutes. So basically, the point is you can 3D print anything, basically, on, in terms of micro-optics. So where are the challenges? Where are the problems? Where are the things that can still be done beyond what is commercially available. And that's what I want to talk about in the remainder of this talk. And I have grouped it into these uh, topics here. Finer features, so can we get smaller than what I showed you before? Actually, what is the resolution limit? I did not speak about resolution so far. Can we make it faster by any way? I mean, 10 centimeters per second is fast. So to give you a feeling, that's faster than typical electron beam lithography. But we make very complex structures. And people get more and more demanding, and they want very fine resolution and big structures together. And then, of course, writing times go up. So how can we make it faster? And then, in a sense, what I showed you so far is very simple. These were all structures composed of just a single material, of just one polymer. If you dream a little bit further about functional system, and you look at your iPhone or anything, you will find out, oh, these things are composed of many, many different materials. Take your iPhone, I'm taking a guess, there are more than a hundred different materials in there. So can we 3D print devices or structures that contain many, many different dissimilar materials? That's the last part here. And I hope time will be enough for this. So um, about line width and resolution. I mentioned line width is not the same as resolution. Resolution refers to the smallest distance between adjacent lines you can get. So how about resolution? Why is that limited? Going back to this picture, we ended roughly here at 100 nanometers or so. I can make it smaller on the computer and make a 50 nanometer voxel. That's not a big deal in principle um, with this technology. Why is the resolution limited? Well, if we now take a second exposure, exposure element, a second voxel, at the moment it's very far apart, and now I move this closer and closer, let's see what happens here, what the issue is. So, so far not much happens. On the right hand side here you see the two individual exposure profiles, and in blue you can now see uh, the sum coming up of these two guys. And if I move it closer and closer and closer, eventually you see that uh, the sum exhibits only a very, very small minimum, 
And if I move them further and further, you get something that is very well known as the Sparrow Criterion. It's actually not the Abbe Criterion or something like that. It's the Sparrow Criterion. It's the point where you lose a minimum in the sum of two exposures. I'm assuming here, of course, that this photoresist system kind of remembers what I've done to it, that it simply saves the exposure doses. But this, unfortunately, is a very reasonable assumption. So here, for 800 nanometers wavelength and a distance of 200 nanometers, I'm losing, losing this minimum, and no threshold on Earth will help me to get two features. So that's the limit. To be precise, it's the two-photon sparrow criterion in the lateral direction. I cannot make structures that are less apart than 200 nanometers in this direction. In this direction, it's again more, roughly this factor of 2.5. So there we are limited by half a micron, which is not so great, actually. Actually, that's a pain in the neck to start with, that this volume element is not symmetrical. What you really want is you want a spherical element such that all three dimensions are equivalent, basically. So how can we get there? Well, we got inspired by the work of Stefan Hell. We started this before. He got the Nobel Prize on that in microscopy, and uh, in the meantime, he got it. And you know that in microscopy, the diffraction limit has been broken. Stefan emphasizes that I must say it has been broken, not it has been circumvented or something. <laughs> he is very, very picky about this point. So it has been broken, he argues, by a technique called stimulated emission depletion. Um, and in, just in case you have never heard about this, let me give you a quick intro because we are using it in roughly the same manner as he does. There are differences. The simplest way I can say this is that you need two different switches. And these switches also stand for color. This would be a red laser and this would be a green laser, just for example. So you need molecules that you can activate with one color, red light, and that you can deactivate or deplete with another color, green color in my case here. And the simplest way to depict this, and Jochen Fischer has made this nice picture, is that we use one laser focus kind of as a mask. We create a very special focus that has a zero in some region. So this focus, the green focus, inhibits the writing in the periphery such that at the end of the day we can write a line that is much more narrow than basically our brush or our original focus that I talked about. I cannot say it any simpler than this. And I can also cast it into this version here, so it's again our writing focus. And now we add a second focus. That's a focus that is very popular in microscopy. It's a donut focus. So it looks like a donut in three dimensions. Or if you look at one cut, the special thing is that it has a zero of the intensity right in the middle. And the basic idea is we write with the red focus, like I explained. And then we take the green focus, so to speak, to eat away excitation at the edges, to deplete it here, to de-excite the molecules, such that the effectively excited volume becomes smaller. It becomes this bluish volume here. So then our excitation profile effectively is the blue one and not the dashed red one here. And now the idea is you crank up the intensity of the depletion beam, and you go and you go, and actually it's even more extreme than what I show you here. And if you follow that um, blue profile here, it's getting a hell of a lot more narrow than the red profile. And now this also applies to resolution. I'm just telling you. I'm not showing you because it looks very messy if I show you this picture with the two spots here all overlaid. Now this translates also in resolution because we're not um, playing with this threshold here. We're really making the effective excitation profile more narrow. So that's what people use in microscopy all the time. And can we also use it in lithography? That was not so clear. So the name stimulated emission depletion suggests that we're using stimulated um, emission. So this is a bit of a more detailed picture of what is going on inside of the resist, more specifically inside of the photoinitiator molecule. That's the molecule that absorbs the light. So you have some ground state manifold and some excited state manifold. And we go from the ground state manifold via two photon absorption into the excited state manifold. And then people in microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, they want that this electron that has relaxed uh, falls down here and shows spontaneous emission. That's what they're looking at. If you talk to somebody in the lithography community, he or she will tell you, oh, that's not what I want at all. 
I don't want my resist to fluoresce. I want that some chemical reaction takes place. So if you take ordinary photoinitiator molecules in photolithography, they are optimized such that spontaneous emission hardly takes place at all, sometimes with 0.1% probability only. But what happens rather is that you get a process called intersystem crossing, that you go to a triplet manifold that doesn't luminesce so much anymore, and from here the electron is um, taken away, you generate a radical, and this radical then generates a, cross, uh, a chain reaction and basically cross-links the molecules at the end of the day. This electron here is, so to speak, the trigger for the entire chemical reaction. So microscopy people want fluorescence, lithography people want uh, this process here to dominate, and um, what we did years ago is we looked at molecules that are somewhat intermediate, such that you have some spontaneous emission, that you have a chance to bring the electron down by stimulated emission. This is clear. So stimulated emission, emission is the switch off process. If you don't do anything, the electron goes here, get chemical reaction. If you excite the electron, but then in some locations you de-excite it, then you do not get a chemical reaction there. That's the switch off process. At least that's the naive picture, um, the textbook picture, so to speak. But it doesn't have to be like that. There are also other processes, and i just show you one. There's a zoo of different possibilities. You can also go in some other intermediate states, and then via excited state absorption and reverse intersystem crossing, go back to the ground state. There are many different possibilities how you can de-excite the system, and not all of them are ideal, but I don't say so much about this. Let's rather look at some uh, experimental things. This, these are some measured foci. So we routinely measure the foci by taking gold beads of 80 nanometer or 100 nanometer diameter, and we scan them through the focus and look at the scattered light and do this in three dimensions. So here you see different cuts. This is again the optical axis. You see this elongation that I talked about. This is the focal plane that looks nice and round. And so this is the normal focus in this case at 810 nanometers wavelength. This would be um, a donut focus that we are not using. That's what people in microscopy are using most of the time. Um, it looks like a donut in the focal plane. In, the, um, <clears throat> in this direction here, actually, you see that now you have a zero of the intensity all along this line. So what this means is that the effectively excited volume is not going to be a sphere or anything close to a sphere. It's going to be the cigar shape. So you eat away from the side, but you do not restrict it in the axial direction at all. This is not what we want, not at all what we want. Then our voxel would be a cigar, and you write very asymmetric structures. So our favorite focus is this bottle beam focus here that you may or may not have seen. So it looks a bit similar in this representation. So we have a zero of the intensity by symmetry in the middle, right where the other focus has its maximum. And then you have kind of mountains of intensity on all sides. So it's like a valley. It's going up the intensity in all directions if you sit in this valley uh, down here. And in the other plane, the focal plane, it again looks more or less like a donut focus, but it's different in the other direction. And just in case you care, um, i show you how you make this. The point here is now you get an almost spherical excitation volume. It's not exactly spherical, but we no longer have this aspect ratio of 2.5 or so. It's very simple, actually, experimentally, if you care. What we do is we take um, a substrate, that's not important, and we have a cylinder on top of that substrate, and it introduces a pi phase shift, 180 degrees phase shift, and the recipe is that the area of this cylinder must roughly be half of the effective area of the beam. <coughs> and then you simply get destructive interference between this part of the beam and the outer part of the beam in the middle. That's what gives you this zero of the intensity right on the optical axis in the focal plane. It's as simple as that. If you want to do it right, you don't put it into the collimated beam for the expert, but you rather put it into the back focal plane of the objective lens, then you do a clean job. In any case, um, what can you do with this? Uh, I'll show you one example. We did this for years. This is um, actually on the summer school um, poster also. Um, this is some old work I don't want to talk about. This is done by ordinary um, laser lithography. These helices that you see here are made out of gold. 
So there's some inversion process where we convert the polymer into a gold, actually bulk gold in this case. And the purpose of this structure was um, to be a broadband circular polarizer, something that didn't exist before. You can send in light of any polarization from one side, and then on the other side, no matter what you send in, you get out circular polarization of a certain handedness, given by the handedness of these helices, and the point is over a very broad bandwidth. You can at least get one octave of bandwidth, and if you play a bit with it, you can even get two octaves of bandwidth. This was unheard of. But never mind, this is not the point I want to make. These structures were nice, but not perfect. And they were not perfect because the fact that this helix has an end breaks the symmetry. So you don't have full rotational symmetry, and hence left and right-handed circular polarization are not the ideal eigenstates of this structure, it turns out. This ending point, together with the middle of the axis, forms something like a C-axis of a half-wave plate. So you do not only get circular biofringence, but you also get some degree of linear biofringence, which was unwanted. And then we thought about this for some years, to be honest. And then the solution was, well, let's not take one helix as the element, but let's take three or four <coughs> intertwined helices. And there it turns out you recover symmetry, and there circular polarization is the good eigenstate. Now, this is obviously a hell of a lot more difficult to make than this structure, and here really the axial resolution matters. And Johannes Kaschke has done a fantastic job over the years. So what we do here is, this is just one unit cell of the structure. We write a polymer scaffold by this dead um, laser lithography. Then we fill it with gold. This is electrochemical plating. This is a standard process. Not simple though. And then we calcine the photoresist, and then you get these freestanding gold structures on the right hand side. This is just a scheme. And this is a direct comparison, and that's why I like this picture here. This is what we published nearly 10 years ago. This was the best we could do at the time after this inversion process. And this is uh, Status three years ago. And you can clearly see uh, here you now three intertwined helices in one unit cell. And you can see that in particular the extent in the axial direction has improved a lot. We have now more spherical um, excitation. But it's not perfect. Um, and you would like to do things with yet a factor of 10 better resolution. So what's the problem here really? Why don't we get better? And the thing is basically this. Um, this is the same formula I showed you before that Stefan Hell likes to uh, show a lot. And the basic physics is extremely simple. You have this minimum of the depletion beam where you have a zero, and at some point you can simply approximate this minimum by a parabola. A big surprise. And then this parabola, this depletion parabola, has to reach a certain intensity to deplete enough. So basically you have some constant equals this prefactor times a parabola. And you have to invert that for the power you have to stick in. And this gives you that the width of this uh, uh, remaining excitation, which I call de delta x, scales like 1 over the square root of the power. It's basically an inverted parabola. There's nothing more behind this, really. So it's reasonably <laughs> fundamental, I would say. And this is a pain in the neck. This is really a pain in the neck. Because it means if you want to improve your resolution, and now I mean resolution, by a factor of 10, you have to increase the power by a factor of 100. That's already something. Usually that's not a problem. We have lasers to do this. The issue is rather that if you increase that power by a factor of 100, then two photon absorption of the depletion beam increases by a factor of 10,000. And that's a huge factor. If there was a teeny tiny bit of residual two photon absorption because you have not perfectly spectrally separated these bands, you will see it. I, and we have seen it. Um, that's the issue. So um, after playing with this for some years, my bottom line has basically been well. Um, what we need is really more efficient and more selective photochemical switches. And we are working on this very intensely with people like Christopher Barnakovolik at KRT. Now he kind of moved to Australia. And this is just one example. Uh, this is not a chemistry audience, so I don't bother you too much with chemistry. But this is kind of cool uh, chemistry, um, I think, from a physicist's view. So this is a photo enol system. And what we do is we excite it by two-photon absorption, in this case at 700 nanometers wavelength. 
then you create some other state here. And this comes in two uh, incarnations. It comes as two isomers, basically. So it's the same atoms, just arranged differently in space. And these isomers have different properties. One of them leads to some other reaction that then eventually leads to the line we are looking at, that we are writing, never mind the details. The other one is kind of passive. It pretty quickly decays back to the ground state. So here's our on switch, and here's the off switch with 440 nanometers wavelength light, blue light. We can make a transition between these two isomers. So this is using photo-induced isomerization in the excited state of this molecule, and this is a more selective process, um, and that's why we liked it and we looked at it. Um, if you care, let me show you one test that we do all of the time, and that is very important to do. So we write uh, to this pattern here, and then we switch off the depletion beam, and then the first thing you must check is that you do not destroy the line you have previously written. Otherwise, this is likely ablation, what you're looking at. Well, you, there are things in the literature. So that's what we do here. Uh, we don't destroy this line. We keep on going. We write. Then we go in this pattern. And then eventually, you also want to make sure that you can write over regions that have previously been depleted. You want to make sure they're not dead forever after that. So that's what we do also. And it works. But you can see some imperfection if you watch closely. And that's, that's an issue. There is some irreversible contribution to it. It's not very large, but it's there. So bottom line here is, don't want to bother you too much with the details. Here you see some example of lines that we have written. Here the depletion beam is off, here it's on, and now we crank up the power. You can clearly see the lines get more narrow. Bottom line here is here we got down to like 60 nanometers, line width and resolution also. And this is a bit special because this resist system, if you care about the details, does not have a threshold. So here the improvement to uh, no de-excitation has been a factor of five or six or so. But eventually it's again limited. There are newer systems that we're looking at the moment. Our best value is now 30 nanometers line width that we can make. But before this comes into applications, um, I guess some time will pass. And I, I skip this. Um, let me tell you a bit about faster writing. This is important to many people because many of the users want to make very large structures with sub-micron definition or with optical quality surfaces. And there are different things. I'll tell you about one thing. I'll tell you about what we call shell writing. And I do not tell you about um, writing with multiple foci um, so far. This is an example um, <clears throat> from the solar cell community. I hope John Penry will tell you a bit more, bit more about these ideas. So here, uh, the problem that we wanted to solve is that solar cells have these electrical wires on top. But this is not a problem per se. They have to be there because otherwise you cannot get the current out of the solar cell. And you need it because the sheet conductance of the doped layer is otherwise too large. Sheet resistance is too large. Um, so people put these wires, they are on all silicon solar cells that are on your roof. They're not on all solar cells per se, but they are on all commercial silicon solar cells. And the issue is that they shadow part of the usable area of the cell. And typically this goes up to 10% or so on commercial cells. 10% of the area is covered with metal and is optically dead, so to speak. And if we could somehow guide the light around these contacts, we could improve the efficiency of the solar cell by relative 10%. As simple as that. In the beginning, to be honest with you, I didn't care. People from solar cell community approached us, and I was kind of snobbish, oh, what do I care about 10%? Um, but it turns out industry cares a lot about 10% relative improvement of the solar cell because they are sold in masses. Anyway, anyway this led us to design structures uh, that guide the light around the contact, and you would make a wild guess, of course, we 3D printed them. And the basic idea for the design is to use coordinate transformations. It's a one-dimensional coordinate transformation. You have, say, the line, the, the, the wire here, and what we do is we do a transformation that expels the contact from space. Well, I hope John does a better job than me. I, I should talk about this for half an hour. It's just some crazy design, how we make the structure, and then we map this onto the shape of some dielectric surface. 
It's a freeform surface in the language of optics. It's a non-focusing optics that we design by this way, and that's how it looks. So this would be air, this would be, say, polymer or some dielectric, this would be the silicon wafer, and here you have the contact. And what we want is that no matter from which direction light comes, what color it has, what polarization it has, it should never land on the contact. And this is what this structure does. You can see it does it by refraction. This light ray, which would otherwise hit the contact, is refracted such that it hits the side here. And the structure is designed such that the light here in this remaining uh, region is distributed evenly. So we avoid the contact and we distribute the light in the remaining parts evenly. There's this singular ray right in the middle, forget this, this is literally a single ray that still makes it onto the contact. And as I said, this uh, not only works for normal incidence, but it actually works for all angles. Up to 20% fill fraction, if you care about the detail, this is perfect on paper, this design, and none of the light rays ever lands on the contact here. So we made these structures, and here shell writing comes into the game. So this is, for our purpose, kind of a stupid structure. We need uh, optical quality surfaces here, otherwise it doesn't work. It will scatter the light. And then you have all this stuff inside here that we write with this fine focus, but at the end of the day we're just writing a block of material. That's totally stupid and very time-consuming. This takes you hours and hours just to write that stupid volume inside there. And one nice trick that we call shell writing is to not do this, but rather only write the surface of this structure. We do not write into the volume, we just write the surface, a couple of microns thick thickness on the surface, I mean this part, also this part, that it's totally sealed, the liquid inside there. Then we take it out, we develop it, then you see the structure, but you have the liquid still inside there. And then we simply take a gallium nitride laser or UV lamp, it doesn't matter, and flood illuminate the entire thing and polymerize the inside. And that's quick, that's just like that. And the benefit here is then we only write the surface and not the entire volume and depending on the architecture you gain as much as a factor of 10 in the writing time. For this um, geometry you gain a factor of 10. And that's a big deal, a factor of 10 in, in fabrication. You cannot always use it, but you can often use this trick to speed up things. And this is just some measurement, sorry that I'm not only talking, this is scanning a laser over the contact and you see the shadow, the current is going down, um, and with this cloaking structure, as we call it, uh, this shadow is massively reduced. There's still a little bit left here, and if you care, this comes from the fact that this notch that we are making has a finite radius of curvature. So what you actually want is a jump in the derivative in the middle of this structure, but if you have a finite radius of curvature, which we have because we have a finite resolution, then you have a horizontal tangent here and then some rays in ray optics just make it through the middle. That's what you basically see here. But this part is really negligible compared to all this other part. So it works quite nicely. And still, this takes way too long to go into mass production, to make square meters of solar cells or square meters of large quantities of other optics. And this is an application that I strongly believe you will see in just a couple of years in industry, and that is to make a master by 3D laser lithography, as I showed you, and then make a stamp out of this. Complicated process, but conceptually it's very simple. At the end of the day, we make ourselves a master out of this, and then we stamp this master by soft imprinting into some other monomer, and then polymer afterwards, so you can make this stamp once, and then you stamp, 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 and make very large areas of this stuff. And I can tell you that industry is going along this path with 3D laser lithography to make micro-optics for mobile phones. In next generations of mobile phones, you will find fancy micro-optics made along this path. I'm not allowed to tell you which companies will be doing this. You will also find this in cars. The increasingly sophisticated lighting systems in the, um, in the headlights of cars. They are not so stupid, actually there are fancy micro-optics in there these days, also made um, along these paths here. Um, in any case, it works. Just to show you some data here, you look front-on to a silicon heterojunction solar cell, 
and uh, this is how the silicon looks under these illumination conditions. Here you see a wire, a contact wire, and if you follow it, you have to trust me that it has been underneath there. Uh, here you don't see anything. In fact, it's quite more black here than here because this structure also serves as a light trapping device. This is sheer luck. This was not in the design, but it's very good. It also traps the light, so this is even blacker and absorbs the light better. Um, and it's kind of cooler to have this thing in front of you and look at it and see that you do not see the contacts from all angles, colors, and blah. And solar cell people give a damn about pictures like that. They want to see results, so if you care, this is for the entire visible. And this is the response here of the solar cell um, for a flat um, <clears throat> structure, and this is with the cloak here. You see, it's not a gigantic improvement we're talking about. I cannot recover more than I have lost by the contacts previously, but it's a relevant improvement, works for all uh, colors and works also for all angles of incidence. And again, for very large angles of incidence, there's some luck. Here it's doing better. This is not worse, this is better. This is again because of this light trapping issue. So this works. There are some friends in Karlsruhe that take this into solar cell systems. I'm not a solar cell guy, so I'm happy with this. It's understood to my taste. Um, but they integrate this into the processes of fancy solar cells. I want to let me tell you a bit about more materials. Um, <clears throat> so there is a brute force way, and I will show you the brute force way. We just do multi-step lithography with different resist formulations. The first example is kind of sneaking around this, and the idea is we take one resist, it's a very fancy resist, and I will not tell you the details of it, and then by playing with the power of the laser, or more precisely with the dose of exposure, we change the level of cross-linking of the material, and we totally change the properties. So we basically start from one resist, but we get, by using different laser powers, very different materials at the end of the day. I'm showing you this visually, it's, it's actually quite simple. Um, so we write uh, with two different powers here, and we look at thermal expansion, and I can tell you um, from the analysis, we changed the thermal expansion coefficient by roughly a factor of 10. It's a very large change. These are not just a little bit different. These materials, they're very different. And they're also very different in the Young's modulus that is also different by about a factor of 10. And in the beginning, you can see the different materials, actually, the two stripes. So we'll make a bimaterial stripe here. I should explain this geometry. This is a 3D structure, you're just looking on top. So this is a post coming off the substrate, and then you have this arm here and it moves. I mean, if it had contact to the substrate, it couldn't move, so it's obviously not on the substrate directly. And then within this rather small temperature regime, you get a lot of bending effect. So you can use this as an actuator, just for example. Just one resist, get very different properties out. I think this is a very interesting reaction, just to make sure that um, you don't think this was a lucky shot that we have after lots of pain made one of these structures and it worked. Here you see an array of 3x3, three three, they all work. This is a damn reproducible technology uh, these days. Uh, it's pretty much the same, apart from some dirt. Let's look at it one more time. And you can play with more sophisticated structures. Um, I showed you so far just two materials, so to speak, A and B. You can alternate it in fancy fashions and not just get bending, but make this structure wrinkle here or whatever you want. And these are the real scales. And these are macroscopic effects. Um, this structure, before you get excited, is operating in water. It's a hydrogel. So depending who you are, this is good or bad. Some people are very much excited about this. Biologists like this a lot. You can use this as an actuator in some biological context. You can use it as an actuator also in microfluidics. I'm not so much a liquid person. I like to do things in air. So I would like to do the same thing in air. That is not possible so far. I mean, this really needs the water. Let me show you a second example where uh, the second material, so to speak, is air. That sounds a bit stupid. I mean, air is all around. Um, but we're making hollow structures that are sealed. I will show you what structures we make. That's a big deal in 3D additive manufacturing. That was not possible so far to make hollow yet sealed structures. I mean, just to give you a crash course in macroscopic 3D additive manufacturing, 
I guess you have seen some of these 3D printers. If you want to do a stupid thing, you want to print a plate of a table. Say you want to extend this plate to here. You cannot do this with normal 3D additive manufacturing because there's nothing you can print on. Obviously, there's a void underneath. You cannot do this. So what people do is they print what they call a supporting or sacrificial material first. They basically fill it up to here, and then they print on top of it, and then they get rid of this material afterwards, which is sometimes possible, sometimes not. If it's completely sealed, obviously it's not possible to get rid of this material. That's why this was not possible to make like a balloon, make an air balloon by 3D printing. That was not possible. Um, well, for some reason we designed structures like that. Um, it's a meta material. It's a very strange meta material that has the property that if you push on it, more precisely if you exert it to a hydrostatic pressure, it does not shrink, but it expands. It's very strange, right? Usually you would think you take any material you want, you push on it from all sides, hydrostatic pressure, what can happen? I mean, it must shrink, right? This material does not shrink, it expands, it has a negative effective compressibility, which is very strange and also perhaps useful as an actuator. So this is the design that Jing Zhuan Chu has come up with. It looks very complicated. Let's have a closer look at one of the unit cells and it contains these hollow cubes. This is just cut open that you can see something. So it has these thin walls here. Uh, and it's hollow, and basically the physics idea is you have these membranes and if the pressure outside of the hollow volume is larger than in the inside, then this membrane will warp, I do the best I can, and then these arms that are connected to the membrane move upwards and make the structure expand. The lattice constant increases if the pressure increases, very strange actually. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, this is the mechanism once again, this is the hollow volume, membrane warps inwards, then these arms move out and you get more motion, motion so to speak, in this direction, then you get uh, shrinkage, so effectively it's a negative compressibility, which was argued a million times is impossible uh, to get. In any case, the, the question here from a fabrication viewpoint is how can we make this? So we're using this shell writing trick I told you about earlier on with um, little change. So we write only the surface of the cube. Um, the liquid stays in and then when we put this into the developer, the developer can move into the cube. It's permeable but the monomer cannot move out so this is uh, leading to an osmotic pressure and this means that this thing swells like crazy. You can actually see this in the microscope easily during the development process and then um, if it swells too much you get cracks. That doesn't sound like a very good idea because then the structure is destroyed. Yes, it is generally destroyed unless you take care and concentrate the stresses such that the structure only cracks at specific points, at specific small regions. Then the monomer will get out in these regions and then comes the magic which I never believed would work and that is, if you take it out of the developer, the structure shrinks again, it's still soft, so it self-heals. So then these cracks self-heal and you get a hollow and sealed structure. It's kind of unusual. It's gas-sealed, the structure, for some time. And that's actually, if you looked fast enough, what these little cubes inside of the big cube were good for. They concentrate the stress at these points, and if you look in the electron micrograph afterwards, uh, you see some remnants of these cracks, you also see this in calculations, but this structure is sealed afterwards. It's just some leftover you see on the surface. And this is um, something you can 3D print. Um, it's a 50 micron side length of these guys. They are only connected by these small arms here. I think this is a fairly sophisticated structure. And all of them are hollow, and most of them are sealed. And you can see this if you look with a microscope just on the top. This is plain image, no magnification, no processing, no nothing. Uh, you see the pressure at the top, so we go up to about three bars. This is what you can get if you blow with your mouth into a tube, no very large pressure. And you can see if you watch when the pressure is high, the structure is big. 
So it's a negative compressibility. And if you watch closely, you can see uh, even this principle that I showed you, this arm is moving like this because of the warping of the membrane. And if you look very closely, you see that most of them work, but not all of them. Where's the guy? This here. This has an issue. This is not working right, probably because this cube has a leak somewhere. We don't have 100% efficiency, but enough that the structure works. It's kind of cute, I think. And if you drive it, you get some very large modulus, but a negative effective compressibility of this structure. Never mind. Um, <clears throat> When should I end? Well, we have time till yeah. 30, so. but with questions. Are there biologists in the room? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, then I skip, simply skip the next example and um, tell you about this one here. This is in collaboration with Zeiss uh, in Jena, to be precise, and um, the idea is the following. Today, um, there are already quite a lot of fluorescent security features in use. Um, this has been in use on Euro banknotes for many, many years, since the beginning of the Euro. In fact, one of the um, materials is Europium, they say. They don't tell you precisely what it is, but from the lines it is very likely Europium in the Euro. It's kind of funny. This is, um, <laughs> this is the... German passport, uh, in the state of last year, uh, in March or so last year, there was a new German passport and that has all these fluorescent uh, markers here. So this is what you see under UV illumination. This is true color image, what you see here. You see red, yellow and some greenish uh, stuff. And of course, I mean, why are people using these security <coughs> features? Because they want to make documents or products safe. Uh, they don't want these to be faked. And this is a constant race between uh, people using technology to protect goods and other people trying to fake goods. Um, so you constantly have to keep on improving because the um, criminals get better also. They also <laughs> access to better and better technology. It's actually quite, a, quite sophisticated if you look at that passport under UV light. Every page is different. Um, uh, where is this? Yes, I mean, even the page numbers are made by fluorescent labels here. So it's kind of cool, kind of simple. So the idea that we came up with in size is, well, why don't we do the same thing in a three-dimensional structure, which is more difficult to make, more difficult to read out, and hence also more difficult to fake it at the end of the day, to put it onto whatever, passports, put it onto goods that are very expensive. And the idea is the following. Let's make a three-dimensional structure that is composed of some passive scaffold, if you want, the gray stuff here, and then also composed of fluorescent bits, if you want. So these are little blobs that are set on a three-dimensional grid just to make it a well-organized structure. And the original idea was, well, let's have green fluorescent parts, blue fluorescent parts, and then you can read this out um, by confocal microscopy actually simplify confocal microscopy and make a scanner out of this that would do this fairly quickly. Here you see the scaffold and you also see we have to make the structure open such that in the development process uh, all the other stuff gets out. These are some of the details. So that's the principle. How would you make such a structure? Well, you would take your glass substrate if you wish, put a drop of the photoresist, put it into the lithography instrument, you would write you would take it out, and then you have to walk to the chemistry room. You have to rinse it in acetone and whatever, isopropanol. You go back um, to your lithography instrument, put another drop of now a different photoresist. And here we have used semiconductor quantum dots immersed in, in an acrylate, if you can, as the fluorescent marker. In a fairly low concentration, you don't need so much. And then you say, oh, oops, now it's not aligned at all. Mm. I put it back in, you have to realign it. This is not so pleasant, um, this step. Once you have done it, you write again. Now with this different resist, which is making the green part, for example, you take it out again, walk to the chemistry room, rinse it, go back to the lithography instrument. Oh, it's not aligned. And put it back in again. And I'm saying this because this is something you can convince or talk a PhD student into for a number of steps, um, three in this case. 
but you will have a hard time convincing her or him to do it a hundred times um, because this is really pain. Any case, this is how this uh, structure was made. And here you see, you see some results. This is a structure sitting on the substrate. This is the substrate plane. And what you see is a 3D reconstruction here. So these are isofluorescent surfaces that you see. We made intentionally a structure that is dense, that's very hard for readout to separate the different bits. Um, and if you look at it, if you look at a cut of this three-dimensional fluorescent stack, this is how it looks. Very imaginatively, we have made an array of green blobs with one left out of it in the first plane. We make a wild guess, a two in the second, third, three in the third, etc. So this works. Um, you can read out the different planes. Um, you can make it with different colors. Um, this is now with blue and green. As you can see, we made a checkerboard in 3D with blue and green and left some parts out just to make clear that this is deterministic and not just some junk we are making here. Again, it's a checkerboard. The blue doesn't come out so well, but you see the one left out, the two, the three, the four, the five, etc. And of course, you can use this kind of a sequential photolithography step to make all kinds of other structures composed of different photoresists. But once again, this is getting really, really painful when the number of different uh, resist materials increases. So then, uh, after the pain has um, reached a certain threshold level, we kind of uh, came up with the idea, well, why do we actually do it like that? Why don't we integrate the entire chemistry room into the 3D printer by using microfluidics? That you don't have to take anything out, you do everything inside of this tight optical focus. Now, before you think, oh, this is a piece of cake, it's not so simple. You have to do this compatible with um, diffraction-limited focusing. So you have a very small space to do this, to build the chamber that does the microfluidics for you. So this was actually a bit of work. But just to give you a, a flavor here, this is what we do these days. You have a certain number of chemicals, in this case seven or so. We pressurize this with nitrogen gas and can pressure this up to this distributor valve here. And then the valve basically switches one of these inputs to the output and that goes to the microfluidic chamber. This is the output cable here, by the way. We make this very small, that we don't lose so much material on the way, and this works quite nicely. Actually, if you, if you care, we started with a commercial valve here, um, and that went down the drain very quickly, because many of these resists that we are using are basically like glues. You can think of them as glues. So if you make them warm at some point or do anything, you have some friction, they polymerize and they glue, and they glue the valve, and the valve is dead. Um, it's actually not such an inexpensive experience. Um, and then we defined, we designed our own valve. This is a home-built valve, actually, that does not have these issues, if you care about the details. And then the output goes into um, this chamber. If there should be a nanoscribe user, this is actually a holder that fits into a commercial instruments, that's the microfluidic chamber, and it can be reused. We're writing basically onto one of the windows of this chamber directly, and after you're done, you take it out. This is super cool. You don't have to take the sample out, and with this you can make many more different colors. And to convince you of that, I have just one example here that has now four different colors. Two colors are quantum dots, semiconductor quantum dots, these cadmium sulfide, selenides, color <coughs> shell, quantum dots immersed in the acrylate photoresist, and two dyes. Um, so we have four colors, blue, green, red, and yellow. This is the design scheme, and this is what we have actually measured here, plus the non-fluorescent part, plus two chemicals. So here, seven different chemicals, seven different liquids are brought into this 3D printer automatically <coughs> in this manner. And if you look at it, it's actually now more fancy. These Crossings here, these blobs, in this case, are no longer just one color, but you can freely choose them any color that you want. But the point I want to make is you don't have to care about security features. You can use this for any other structure that you want to make composed of different uh, resist systems. This is, um, I think, a big step forward. Um, if you give me five minutes, I will come to an end. I can also stop now. A few. Okay, five minutes, I mean, yeah, it's okay. Just tell you one thing. So, 
these structures are very nice, um, but it's unbelievably difficult to get rid of them, if you want to get rid of them. These acrylates, you cannot etch away by any chemical that I know of. You can ash them, you can put it into an, an oven at five, 600 degrees Celsius, and calcine the structure, and then it's gone. But very likely, other parts of your structure will be destroyed too. You can put it into an oxygen plasma for tens of hours and get rid of these structures, but then again, very likely, whatever other structure you have made will be dead too. I mean, take this photonic wire bond idea I told you about in the beginning. Suppose you have made on some very expensive and valuable optical chip a connection and you made a mistake. Well, you can throw it away. That was Status last year. Or you find a way how to cleave chemically under mild conditions these photoresists. But then you have to come up with new photoresist systems. And this is one of the examples. So this is a two-component structure that we made. One is our favorite acrylate. It's a structure that is made for cell culture. I skipped earlier on. And we now introduce the second resist that, that is composed of a disulfide network, this greenish stuff in this scheme here. And the idea is that, that you can simply <coughs> expose to some chemical and it will dissolve under mild conditions. So after the cleavage, it should like that. So we can selectively cleave one and not the other. And this is perhaps then the last example I show you. Um, <coughs> this was written with 700 nanometers wavelength of light. It's a decent photoresist. This scale bar here, here you see the structure. This was the disulfide network. This is a usual acrylate. And then with the conditions that I've described down there, we could dissolve these, these parts here. And you can do this with any other shape. There are many more examples in this publication. So if you need some support material for some fabrication step, now this is possible also. The only complaint that people had was that this has been done with 700 nanometers wavelength of light. Um, in commercial instrumentation, you use 780 nanometers, and it doesn't work with that. And sorry for that. Um, but now there are other resists, and I, I don't tell you about this. Uh, if you care, there is a recent Nature Comp paper where we have even selective cleavage of different materials. These are the best, actually, from my perspective. These are all our results, so I can say this. The best structures are in here. Also here you have one that you can expose at 800 nanometers standard wavelength. And the big deal is also for biological applications to get biodegradable resists that you can degrade by water or by enzymes such that you can make scaffolds for cell culture and at the end get rid of the scaffold without killing the cell. That's a big deal. That's something we are working on. And I just skipped this. And this is my last view graph. I hope I've given you an overview of what is possible like this today. And this is a lot. You can do this and learn this in a couple of days. If you want to go beyond what is possible, then it's getting hard. My experience is looking at some new resist idea. That's something that takes you a year or two or perhaps even one PhD thesis. This is not a piece of cake to come up with these new ideas. If you want to get an overview of what the challenges are and what can be done, last year we wrote this very long uh, review article here that you may have to have a look at this. That's it.